and most the, the key there is is associated with and and let let me look a little at the historical record i would be the first to agree that the industrial revolution starting in the say mid 1700s running through the victorian period was extraordinarily accelerated by things like james watt's much more efficient steam engine uh, or uh, Tesla's induction motor. Uh, I think it's kind of coincidental that they were energy technologies. You could say that the, the uh, modern processes for making ammonia for fertilizer uh, were an energy technology. That's a bit of a stretch. It's, it's chemistry. But uh, why don't you make the same case for improvements in education or in public health or in telecommunications, which you would hardly say are energy technologies? There are a lot of things we did in society to uh, increase wealth, to grow the economy faster. Some of those had to do with energy technology, some didn't. But I think it's uh, a bit of a category mistake to say that because two of those, the induction motor and the steam engine happen to save fuel, that means that saving fuel uh, increases total energy use. And, and that's really confusing energy uh, system operations with a wealth effect. People got enormously wealthier, some more than others, uh, as uh, affordable mass goods spread all over. And a lot of that also was about labor productivity. When the Industrial Revolution was starting, you could oversimplify a bit and say there weren't enough weavers in England to make enough cloth for most people to afford. And if you'd come into Parliament in 1750 and said, don't worry, we'll make weavers 100 times more productive, the concept would have been not just laughed out of the room, but it would have been utterly incomprehensible. Nobody would have understood what you're talking about. But in fact, soon a Lancashire spinner could soon make the cloth that it required 200 weavers. And as, as that spread all over the economy, that kind of innovation uh, of greater productivity in one or another factors, uh, often many, you got affordable mass goods, purchasing power, middle class, all the artifacts that we see around us as the hallmarks of an advanced industrial economy. Look at, say, the purchase of refrigerators or air conditioners in many developing countries today where people are starting to get that purchasing power. You might say, well, it's the existence of a more efficient way of cooling yourself or your food that is leading to a great increase in electricity use. Now, of course, for an economist, this is called an increase in welfare. People buy the stuff because they want it and they, they have more well-being in some sense. Uh, <clears throat> but obviously, if you use refrigerators and air conditioners many times more technically efficient than the lousy ones often on the market in poor countries, uh, then electric demand will grow that much less. And indeed, if they're efficient enough, or if the buildings are better and other improvements take place in technical efficiency, there's actually no reason that energy demand over time shouldn't go down, even as those people become rich. And in fact, um, we've just completed with our Chinese partners a major analysis of reinventing fire in China, and it turns out they can uh, sextuple their energy productivity by 2050, trillions of dollars cheaper than business as usual. Uh, that is, they could run a sevenfold bigger economy with scarcely more energy than now. And the reason their saving potential is about twice as big as in the United States in percentage terms is not just that we were more efficient to start with in the U.S., it's mainly that China is building so much new infrastructure and it's a lot easier to build things right than fix them later. So that gives them an advantage in catching up efficiency faster, and that is clearly uh, their resolute intent.